17 players would make their debuts in 1953. Names like Marquis, Williams, Barassi, Case and Frank Bluey Adams. Well, he came up and played uh, a few games and he didn't really set the world on fire. And uh, he, I, I, I can't remember exactly where he played, probably half-back flank, half-forward flank, but he didn't seem to do anything uh, of note. And then it was only by sheer well, Norm Smith's genius that he decided that because Dennis Coulter was so dominant in the ruck, he could afford to have a, someone running along beside him. They call it ruck roving, but uh, he, he just let, sent Brassie out to, to follow Dennis around, and, uh, and that's how it evolved, really. Noel McMahon, the captain, the great captain, uh, he retired. Uh, Ralph Lane, a winger. Dennis Cordner, a superb uh, ruckman. Stuart Spencer, prematurely uh, left. Uh, He'd married a Tasmanian girl, Faye, and uh, she eventually uh, got her way. I think she regrets it now. But uh, Stewie left at the prime, I think he was the best raver in Australia, when he left. His deputy would be Ron Barassi. Barassi had been part of Melbourne all his life. His father had played alongside Norm Smith before losing his life at Tobruk. From 17 to 21, the young Ron Barassi would live with Norm and Marge Smith. Moulded into the game's most inspirational ruck rover, he was at his most telling in the mid to late 50s, but he got no special favours from the coach. Hardest on brass of all the players, like, you know, um, he, he wasn't, he wasn't, we, we had a nickname for him, which I can't say over uh, on a tape, but, it, but he was particularly hard on Ronnie, I thought, than anybody else. Uh, but he was, he was fair in the respect that he treated everybody the same. Uh, you didn't, he had no favourites. Smithy never played favourites. One of, if not the most determined person that I've ever met, whether it was on a football field or off the football field. Like after a game of footy in our day, you'd play a game of table tennis. Well, Barassi just would not be beaten. And, and he would work and work and work uh, until he won. And the same on a football field. I don't think that Ron had the greatest... Uh, I don't think he had the abilities of a Robert Flower. But he was a very, very, very determined man uh, to succeed at what he was doing. He just wanted to win. And from the throw in there as Westcott drives it out, but Barassi of Melbourne comes in to get the ball. He turns onto his left foot. He drives up further on the half-forward flank. The Sun had published the players' numbers. The VFL insisted they change Guernsey numbers for the match. Barassi, for example, trading the famous number 31 for number 2. In heavy conditions, Melbourne got away to an early lead. Well, my summary of uh, that awful day in 58 was that uh, half, of, half of us wanted to fight and the other half scribbed it. Uh, or looked as though they'd scribbed it anyway. Now, you can't ever uh, succeed in a team game unless you're all doing the same sort of thing. And I reckon if we'd been that way united, uh, well, we would have won. Because there's no doubt in my mind that we are the best team on the year. Usually number nine tries a drop kick, one of the few we've seen today. And that's Barassi chipping right in in front of Rose. Had they collided, they both would have been out for six months. Barassi between the half and full forward lines. He's 50 yards out from goal. His kick is going into the goal square. And the kick through. That's a goal. 103,000 saw Barassi steal the initiative from the Bombers with three goals in seven minutes. It would be a tour de force from the Melbourne vice-captain and help his side to a six-goal victory. BOG that day, yeah. And particularly, I thought, from uh, half-forward forward, uh, I think a lot of people have talked over the years what a great Ruck Rover Brass was. I always believe he was the best forward, uh, forward pocket I've ever seen because he did his best things between the full forward line and the half forward line. Oh, just taps it over towards Tunbridge. Tunbridge way out on his own. This boy will show you what to do with it with a yard start. He just screws it off the side of his foot, the Barassi in the forward pocket. So easy for Melbourne at this stage. Barassi would be about 40 yards out on his wrong side, but not on a particularly acute angle. And there goes the siren to end what has been a disappointing game with Melbourne taking out the premiership for 1960 with a convincing victory. And that is a good decision from umpire Swab. Barassi's coming off. Bad blow for Melbourne. 
golly how they go through the rest of the finals matches if they're going to be without him. Well, I feel that Perez, he must be really hurt to come on on his own initiative. He called for the trainer to bring the other player on, and Barassi must not like coming off because he's too great a team man. And by and bounces the ball. We see the uh, ball knocked by McKenzie. Barassi handballs it out to the open spaces, going towards Graham. In round 17 at Punt Road, Melbourne would easily account for Richmond by eight goals. Along the way, Ron Barassi would be reported for striking Roger Dean. This was headline news. The captain of Melbourne, the biggest name in football, was suspended for four matches. He would not play for Melbourne in the final series. Rankled with me uh, for a long, long while. So probably the, I'm not a bitter type person, thankfully. Uh, but if I was, it, that'd be number one on the list because we weren't allowed to present evidence, which would have at least thrown doubt on the thing. And if in doubt, you, you might get out. Apart from not being allowed to produce even a still photo, I mean, the still photo showed he, uh, Roger on the ground with a ball. Now, you don't get a whack of the severity that the umpire claimed it was in, in the face and still hold on to the ball. Now, come on. I think Ron's uh, got a bit of dementia. I think someone's got a problem somewhere because uh, he definitely hit me and that's it. A very good act by, by Roger Dean. And, and the thing that surprised me at the end of the day when it did go to the tribunal, like the entire football knew of Roger's acting ability. They really did. And for, for Brass to get f four weeks for that, uh, when in my opinion there was an opportunity for him actually to get off, was, was just absolutely unbelievable. Frank Adams would lead Melbourne onto the MCG for the finals. They'd beaten St Kilda in the first semi and now faced Hawthorne in the preliminary final with Barassi looking on. Even the skipper had the local customs down pat. It would signal the beginning of a fortnight of fierce rivalry. It was the chance to prove just which was the outstanding team of the season, even if it was to be proved in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Norm was not alone in that. We, it sounds very arrogant, but we knew we were a better side. We'd thrashed them by about six or seven goals, I think three or four weeks before the finals started. What, what people don't uh, remember about that year is that Geelong at that period in time, they always used to beat Hawthorne for some unknown reason. They played Hawthorne, in the last match of the season to get in the finals. They played Hawthorne the next game, two weeks later, in the second semi-final, Hawthorne again. They win, they play Hawthorne again, so they've played Hawthorne, their favourite side, three times in a row in five weeks. Uh, so we didn't take a notice of them winning the Premiership, we, we actually thought we were a better side and uh, we had a bit of pleasure. You can't prove anything like that again because you don't get the chance. But we did beat them twice overseas. And the old foes would meet again on grand final day. Oh, I think Melbourne broke a lot of rules. I think if, you, if you're pretty, got pretty good uh, 18 and you're well managed and well coached uh, and you really have a go, I mean, you, you, you're going to have a chance no matter if you are a bit weak here and there or not as strong as one would like to be here and there. I mean, uh, Melbourne uh, never had a, you know, a name full forward in the whole of that period. Of all the players in the team, with the possible exception of Hassa Mann, uh, he was the best one for the ball to go to if you wanted someone to remain cool, take the ball cleanly, one grab, and kick it straight with an absolute minimum of time. And that was the situation, and uh, so it went to him. I'm sure today that we have seen one of the greatest spectacles of our Australian games ever played on this ground. It wasn't as special as it should have been because I'd played one of the worst finals games ever. And uh, I was still coming to terms with that. I, I mean, I'm just so thankful we won because, I mean, it's very bad to play a bad game, but. To, to play a poor game and lose this would be even worse. So at least we won. Norm Smith and Ron Barassi, perhaps the most famous partnership in the history of the Melbourne Football Club. Smith, the fiery orator, Barassi, the inspirational leader. After the fairy tale end of the 1964 season and a sixth premiership from eight attempts, things would never be the same again. 
If there was a pivotal moment in the history of a football club, this was certainly that moment. The Melbourne skipper stunned his legion of fans by accepting a lucrative offer to move to Carlton as captain coach. But I've never been closer. And Norm uh, is a great man. He's offered to help me in any way, uh, coaching-wise. Any problems, he's gone through the same thing. He's had to go, not had to go like... Uh, well, yes, he had to go, whereas I don't have to go. It's the difference between he and I when he went to Fitzroy. But he knows uh, the trouble about leaving a club that he has had a long association with and going to a new one. And any way he can help me, well, he will. He's uh, just great in this way. After 203 games, five seasons as captain, two as premiership skipper, and with the highest profile in football, Barassi was off to conquer new fields. And history has shown he would do just that with Carlton and later North Melbourne. To this day, he doesn't regret the move. It was a very, very hard thing to do. I mean, I mean, the opportunities for me were just, I mean, undoubted. So that was not even a question. It was just... The only question was, you know, leaving Melbourne. Uh, and I changed my mind a couple of times, which <laughs> for old Carl must have driven them crazy. And in the background, the lingering doubt over Smith's support for the clearance of his greatest player, Barassi, to Carlton. Barassi, although with another club, made a special appearance. I would say one thing. Everyone knows it's a tragedy what has happened. But the thing that I feel is grossly unjust is the allegations that the club have made on North Smith's character, which I feel uh, is wrong and I can't understand any committee coming to this decision and allegation after knowing the man the way they have. He's been at Melbourne almost 30 years and uh, he's been straight and honest all those 30 years. And even if it were true, and it's not of course, but even if it were, I mean the fact that they didn't give him a chance or any way at all, it's, it's, it's beyond me and uh, it's a pity such a great club has seen fit to do such a thing. Do you think the wound can be healed? No. It made for fiery Sunday lunchtime TV. In November 1967, Melbourne farewelled Norm Smith with a dinner at the Melbourne Town Hall. Checker Hughes and Ron Barassi joined in the picture with his successor John Beckwith. While Ditterich was preparing for a move to Queensland, he argued that the club should pursue its most famous son. It was time for the return of Ron Barassi. From 1965 until he left North Melbourne at the end of 1980, Ron Barassi had coached nearly 350 games. He'd lifted Carlton from oblivion to its first flag in 21 years and had taken North to its first premiership in 1975. Melbourne welcomed the super coach back with open arms. Chairman Sir Billy Snedden, General Manager Dick Seddon and high profile radio personality Darren Hinch, who'd led the campaign, rejoiced. In 1981, the prodigal son had returned. I just have a little feeling that there are some things uh, the players have to learn, particularly about team football. Um, and part of a, a, the job of a coach is to teach. I'll be doing that. As well as Adrian Gallagher, there would be a team featuring Barry Richardson, Slug Jordan, Keith McKenzie, John Tekel and Peter Smith. The five-year plan had been implemented. Back at the club, Gary Hardiman after three years with Sturt. I was probably the, uh, of their biggest recruit uh, and I was uh, 31 years of age. So, um, no, Brassie, I think in that year, went through around about 40 players and turned over a, a, a lot, of, lot of players trying to, to get the players up. He, he said it was going to be a five-year plan, but, um, you know, I think uh, personally he wanted to get things done straight away. After the Demons lost to St Kilda, Barassi demanded action. Early morning training runs, no beards. Gary Baker and Peter Giles faced the razor. Discipline was the catchword. There is a sartorial splendour in the form of Ronald Dale Barassi with the matching bow tie and pocket handkerchief. Barassi was dapper, but he lost none of that famous snarl. This was the coach at his most belligerent. The victim, Shane Zantuck. Zantuck and Barassi are having a go. The players are pushing Zantuck away from him. Oh, Barassi's white down there in the, in the face, but they had a real go, and I'm, I'm not kidding. The players had to push uh, Zantuck away. He's wanting to go back and have a go on him again. 
Today, the two protagonists can laugh. Then it was deadly serious. Look at you, you pack of weak that he said, none of you all look me in the eye. So, you know, I, I did, uh, I graduated from Broadmeadows West Tech, see? so that was a pretty, pretty high level of education. But I was always smart enough to listen to what he had to say. So I thought, well, at least when he gets to me, I'll, uh, the least I can do is look him in the eye. So as he's, he's going along, the, the, you know, the bit of spit starting to come out on the moustache and a bit of froth, and I thought, well, here we go. So he gets to me, and he, so I look him, I look him, you know, just out of, out of fright. So he says to me, don't look at me like that, you have smart ass little <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> so I said, well, what do you, you've just had a go at all the boys here for not looking at you. I'm looking at you and you're having a go at me. I said, you're nothing but a big sook. <laughs> <laughs> this is new. There had been other moments, this one a standout. Hello, Healy off, Allingworth on. Bloody weakest piss. I mean, don't look at me like that. How many kicks have you got? That's the answer to everything. Possessions. You give me possessions and I'll shut up. It was unbelievable that day, but I, I just looked at the film clip before and uh, looked at uh, when Shane was involved in that and I, I did notice myself come in and I didn't look at Barassi, I looked the other way and I thought, oh, well, that, that must have been the reason when he said, look me in the eye, and I thought, well, I'll get Shane out of here and look after him and bugger Barassi. In 1985, Melbourne would sign a 20-year lease and make the Junction Oval its training base. For Barassi, this would be his last hurrah. His professionalism on the football field, I think what he did, he planted a lot of seeds for the, the club to grow. And uh, whilst we didn't have the success in the era that he was there, he put those seeds there for future coaching. And it gave all the players that were under him at the time a stepping stone to the, the level of success that we had in uh, the year 87 onwards, really. And uh, I put that down to Brass and, and what he did in his five years at Melbourne. There would be no miracles under Ron Barassi, but his coaching days did leave one legacy. The man who captained the Galahs to Ireland a quarter of a century earlier returned and plucked a rare prize. The vision and foresight would reap rich rewards in the decade ahead. Merger talk was in the air. Everyone had a stance. Barassi would later oppose the merge. 